Hey everyone, welcome to Growing Web3 podcast. I'm super excited to have with me uh, Anara. Anara is um, a colleague of mine. Uh, she works on Third Academy, amongst a load of other things, which uh, she's about to tell you about. And today we're going to be focusing on discussing digital fashion and how uh, digital fashion brands are growing within um the metaverse within Web3. So great to have you on, Anara. Maybe you could give a quick introduction and some background on yourself. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to get to talk about this. Um, my name is Anara. I spent 10 years as a performer uh, learning to how to tell stories both in front and behind the camera. So I have been focused on giving getting people equipped for the digital space and being able to continue become become storytellers in the developing metaverse that we're currently stepping into. I am the founder of a digital fashion engine called Armoire. And like you mentioned, I also teach Web3 marketing at Third Academy. My goal is really to expand the notion of what creativity means in virtual spaces and discuss how people can essentially make it a living. Amazing. Um, so yeah, you briefly touched on what we were kind of doing before you got into uh, this space. Um, What's kind of been your journey into Web3 from the digital fashion media world into yeah, Web3? How did that come about? Yeah, so hindsight is always twenty twenty, so it almost feels inevitable that I was going to be doing this anyways. But I got very interested in the intersection between fashion and technology when I started to attend and also produce music and tech festivals. They became epicenters of cultural innovation that were attracting a lot of um, outsiders, but also mainstream thinkers and really creating an amazing ecosystem for people to think about the future of various industries. I got very passionate about um, education and helping people that are not part uh, of the tech ecosystem to be onboarded into that space. So I built a couple of boot camps um, to essentially help more people be part of the tech sector. And in that journey, in that process, I got very interested in the overlap between fashion and tech. And during the pandemic, uh, it was quite easy to start to talk about the future of digital spaces because we were spending so much time actually online, both to socialize with our friends and family, as well as for our work environment became fully digital. And uh, people started to wonder what it would look like to uh, fashion our virtual lives uh, and talk about the notion of us becoming avatars and seeing that journey kind of expand uh, even more. So I started hosting conversations online about digital fashion as, as a topic and um, am humbled to be part of this developing future as we're stepping into it. Amazing. So um, yeah, you're very much at the forefront of that shift because I think we, we discussed this previously um, a few years ago. Uh, like things were start sort of bubbling up, NFTs were bubbling away, but there hadn't really been any product market fit for them. And then when the pandemic hit, this kind of uh, sped up the innovation massively around mm -hmm. NFTs and um, obviously news like live events couldn't happen anymore. So a lot of things became digital, like they had to become digital to survive. And then this kind of merge of these two worlds, this Web3 world and yeah, this cultural world, I think, really started to started to happen. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe you could talk a little bit about what kind of digital fashion looks like in the Web3 context, like now as it yeah. is today. Yeah, I think, you know, everybody knows the story of the emperor who had no clothes. So I think a lot of people, when they think about digital fashion, kind of get very confused and like, why would you create clothes that you cannot wear considering how physical of a product fashion actually is? So to begin ex kind of explaining where digital fashion fits in, I like to say that we actually all already have a digital body because even though for most of us, it might not look 3D yet, we've been sculpting our virtual identity with the help of all of the usernames and social profiles and websites we've ever contributed to our virtual persona online. And as we kind of 
started to join communities and seek belonging in either in forums or in different uh, chat rooms and joining communities that will essentially help us uh, feel like we're part of a community. We will also eventually want to dress up that virtual identity as it starts to, um, you know, look more 3D. And we started to see that phenomenon happen with PFP collections uh, as NFTs introduced more of like series of uh, human beings or humanoids that actually made you feel like you are connected to them. So the question I asked is like, what will your PFP want to wear in the metaverse? And what does that uh, what does that journey actually look like? So fashion can appeal to a fully virtual life, as well as uh, products and companies that exist in the physical world that also want to um, materialize in virtual spaces. Yeah, that's kind of phenomenal. I love that concept that we already have like a digital body, digital version of ourselves. And yeah, I think, yeah, that's a trend that's really happened over the last 18 months. Um, I feel like a bit of a loser because I'm still like the guy who has his normal headshot <laughs> on Twitter and I'm like, oh, okay, I really need to change that. So I, I might do that today because um, my digital body doesn't feel great right now. It doesn't feel very innovative. Um, but what yeah, are you going to be really, wearing? <laughs> I, I, quite, I quite like this uh, NFT collection called Miladies. Mm. They're quite quite random and they're kind of niche right now. So I've got a few of those. Cool. Um, so maybe I'll put one of those up. But um, okay. yeah, I think that we, we see like... Um, yeah, we've seen like bored apes and these p really popular PFPs go through like also, they've also started to come to contact with fashion, right? Because there was like the Adidas mm -hmm. bored apes. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's like, you're flexing if you've got a bored ape um, or you're showing you're part of a community. And then you're also adding like, you know, uh, the Adidas version, which I think had specific clothing. Um, mm -hmm. They were like 3D with specific clothing pieces on so yeah it's very cool that that's becoming uh becoming a trend and yeah i love that it's a uh, i think a lot of people when they think of digital fashion think of the metaverse immediately but really like you said it's it's potentially even more important dressing up this digital body on twitter because more people might see it for now mm -hmm. um very cool very cool and what do you think uh kind of the key differences between the way digital fashion is moving or growing um, in the Web3 world and kind of in the normal world, I guess. Yeah, I think digital fashion can seem as a very separate aspect of both the fashion and tech industries because it doesn't, it is first of all so new and it also sits uh, in this new area that requires somebody to have an understanding of what the fashion, the e-commerce world is like, and then also looking at the tech ecosystem and how people actually behave within the space. So digital fashion to me is a step that can provide extra level of connectivity, uh, connectivity be between your physical and your digital experience and allows you to actually take your user on a journey as your brand starts to mature and kind of secure its place within the landscape and also allow it to belong in multiple places. You can have only so many brick and mortar stores in the physical world, but your virtual presence can be um, really useful for so many people that uh, don't live in a specific zip code where your brand can be very present. So as we start to see spaces and virtual spaces emerge like uh, Decentraland and the Sandbox and, and all of the virtual worlds where people spend time, these may not be the worlds where we spend time in five to 10 years, but they're starting to showcase the behaviors of how people like to spend time online. So in my, I, I kind of coined a term for myself that uh, in order for brands and, and creators to actually break into the space, they will have to become meta brands and meta creators, which essentially has the framework of the metaverse in mind as they start to build out and adapt products for this new, new space. So the same way how the internet made uh, companies have to develop their digital brands. I think uh, the metaverse in a similar way is asking creators and brands to consider their strategy for um, entering this space too. Yeah, it's crazy. It's like there was obviously retail strategy, sell your stuff in stores. Then there was a digital strategy, sell your stuff online through, you know, a website or Instagram or wherever it may be. And now it's what's your metaverse strategy what's your web3 strategy which i think is 
really exciting because it kind of flips everything on its head um, because you can't really go advertising first, which is like the traditional mm. way. You have to go community first. Um, and yeah, this is, this is creating a lot of interesting challenges for brands um, at the moment. So, okay, I've got a load more questions I was going to ask, thinking which one to ask next. Okay, so what new things, what new kind of uh, experiments, I guess, are we seeing brands do now that they have this like fully digital platform um, with, within Web3 communities on the metaverse? Um, what kind of new things are we seeing happen? Yeah, so I, I'd love to kind of circle back to the brand that you already brought up, which is Adidas. So I think they are one of the few brands that were already quite well positioned to enter this new space. Um, in 2015, uh, they launched a five-year strategy that was called, I think, Creating, Creating the New, which focused on becoming a brand that is also owned, uh, or not even a brand, becoming an open source company that then will be co-owned by all of the athletes, partners, consumers, and everybody who they brought on board for those specific campaigns and for those specific products. And this made them very well positioned to become a brand that actually explores the idea of co-sharing uh, and uh, fractionalized IP and being able to kind of reflect this message of like, we want to interact and engage with our target uh, target audience, target consumer, and for them to be able to develop physical assets as well as digital assets and meta experiences became easier because they were all connected already, not just to um, the products that they're putting out on the market, but also to the message that they're creating. And in my opinion, like everything that you put out into the metaverse should already be reflective of your current brand and your current message. So it, it will require people to adapt their business business model to actually be able to um, participate in the metaverse and create a, an experience that is very cohesive across all platforms awesome yeah that idea of co-ownership um like personal ownership as well i think is mm -hmm. something that all brands should really try and embrace before they even get started on their web3 journey because it's you know the things they're creating are meant to be the whole, the whole point of Web3 is that people own the assets mm -hmm. themselves, right? They can't get, uh, the, the brand can't just turn something off and tell you it's worthless. Maybe they can tell you, but it won't be if it's an NFT because you'll hold it in your wallet. Mm -hmm. um, and if the community believes it's valuable, then it can be valuable. Um, mm -hmm. It kind of works outside of the brand or outside of, yeah, their control. And so mm -hmm. I really like that Adidas. Uh, I've already started thinking about how to give that control to the people who, yeah, are working there and yeah, a big part of it. That's, that's really awesome. And in 2015 as well, that's, mm -hmm. yeah, Pre that was NFT. way ahead. <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah, no one knew what an NFT was at that point. No one. Um, cool. And what, what do you think are kind of the main challenges, I guess? Yeah, we already briefly spoke about this. Um, but yeah, the main challenges for brands coming into the space and yeah, what mistakes do you see some brands making? Yeah, I think if you look at the way that the DeFi ecosystem has developed, there is an expectation from customers and people that have invested in products for the team to be very accountable to them. So if you join a Discord channel and you observe like how people actually interact um, especially around token launches or anything that is a kind of a financial product. People uh, are very interested in the roadmap of the product. They want the founders to be visible. They have questions about what's going to happen next. So the community is no longer just a peripheral, peripheral component of how brands uh, are built, but they are the foundation and actually probably the most important stakeholders for the community to maintain, to, to build up mm -hmm. their trust, to earn their trust. And brands, I think, for a very long time were in a position where they were speaking towards their audience, but not really knowing how to actually incorporate that feedback uh, back into their company. Like how do you create spaces and places where you get to interact with your valuable customers? Also 
make them allow them to contribute to your brand because at the end of the day i don't think there is ever going to be a single person or a single brand that knows all of the answers about even their own ecosystem no matter you know how many consultants come into into your world the consumer and the customer really has some of the most important data points that you actually need so when i think of a brand that has done something well uh, that is uh, red bull in my mind because they are an example of a Web2 company that has successfully built a lifestyle around their products. And they became synonymous with words like adventure, extreme sports, intensity, energy. Yeah. And even though, yes, we, they do market a, an energy drink, they also understood how to be present in the right place at the right time with the right people. So for brands who don't embrace this process of experimentation, trying something new, being visible and, and interacting with their audience and also being very transparent about the mistakes. I think it's a missed opportunity because I, I do understand how you might want to shield your brand from any negative press or any anything that go, went wrong. But in the Web3 space, I think it's a huge plus when you're able to talk about your shortcomings as well as your wins and actually invite people along for the conversation. So doing that, I think, would be uh, is something I would want to see more in the ecosystem. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting that when when uh, we work with larger brands, um, and it comes to like how are we going to present the team, how are we going to position the mm-hmm. team or the brand. Um, in some cases, the the founders or the CEOs, like the executives, are actually quite keen to be involved. Um, and quite keen to put their name on things, um, which is really, really exciting. And in other cases, they just want the brand to be at the forefront, which is completely fine as well. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting to see how the dynamic changes uh, between uh, organizations where the founders or the CEO are really, really bought in and they're happy to like, be like yeah, I'll jam in the Discord and answer some questions um Mm -hmm. whereas others are like no this is a brand focused project and um it will it will be like we'll talk through the brand to the community which can also work and be effective which brands do you think are doing the best job of linking digital fashion and uh web3 yeah i think as Overall, I think any brand that's actually tried to run a campaign in a virtual space, whether it means Roblox, Decentral, Crypto Voxels, they are imperfect ecosystems. Like they're not synonymous with the vision that Ready Player One may have already painted in our minds of what a metaverse looks like. But I think as a brand, it is very important to begin that experimentation so that you can actually develop learnings and understand how your brand can adapt to, the, to these new spaces as, they are, as they're evolving. Uh, we already mentioned Adidas and how they've already um, paired up with other projects and created an ecosystem and uh, alliances between other communities that are doing something similar and kind of became synonymous with those spaces as well. But I also would love to highlight um, a brand, uh, Dolce Gabbana, because they've done a campaign quite recently, um, I believe at the beginning of 2021, that launched several NFTs that opened up doors to experiences that were previously available only to their high-end clientele. Uh, that were now available through the purchase of NFTs. So whether that meant somebody is now qualified to have a custom garment created for them or they're able to attend a party that um, may have been very exclusive in the past, now the NFT membership allowed them to step into that world as well. So uh, whether this is the best way of executing a campaign or not, we're still, I think, are going to see that um, kind of... uh, those steps will be defined as more and more campaigns come out. But I do feel like it's very exciting for brands to reconsider who gets to partake in those experiences and open it up to the crypto community. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, I, I agree. Both those brands have done like a phenomenal job um, of yeah, making the experience something special. I think that's like where we try and direct people is like what spe- what can we do that's like next level that's really really special um to this new medium right like anyone can just put a photo or a garment into an nft and sell it as but that doesn't there's nothing special or interesting about that anymore maybe that was interesting two years ago but um we really want to think about what does the technology enable so it enables things like ownership enables things like access 
um, and how can yeah how can we uh, tile that together into like an amazing experience and yeah I agree mm-hmm. Adidas um, have done very cool things the Dolce & Gabbana campaign was awesome it definitely tied in all those elements um, and yeah I think the other key thing is like community um, it's like how how can these things help grow their community um, and that's one way that I always one thing I always find like to like a health check is you can just jump into discords and you can kind of see what the chat is about and see you know within like an hour of poking around how engaged how cool how fun how excited the community are I think that's a nice like barometer mm-hmm. as well um, what do you think how do you think the space is going to grow over the next six to 12 months? Do you think every brand in the world is going to launch an NFT Web3 community or will it be phased out? What do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, I definitely think every brand in the world is now aware of what NFTs are and how that's going to be impacting their business model. Um, I do still think that the metaverse uh, in the image that Hollywood has painted in our minds is still quite a few years away. However, the thing that NFTs have kind of given us is the ability to actually author digital content and being able to share it with a an original source being immutably attached to the proliferation of that uh, of that piece of content. So what brands have been working on for a while is protecting their IP and being able to kind of create a brand that um, you know, has a history and especially if you're talking about luxury fashion brands, there is so much focus on the craftsmanship and how something is made and how it's revealed and like the entire, you know, ritual of the fashion week. And now when we're talking about virtual spaces, I think some brands are facing this, you know, um, a very difficult decision to understand like, okay, how do we continue to preserve, uh, I guess, presenting our products in a special way and in a unique way while not being able to talk about our physical products and the craftsmanship and what does digital craftsmanship in these spaces actually looks like. So there will be some good experiments, some experiences that, that, that you know, might not land well with the audiences, but both are incredibly needed. And I do not think that NFTs are going to be going anywhere simply because of the potential of what they're actually enabling us to do. One, it gives a pathway to brand, uh, to creators, individual creators and collectives to be able to release product directly to their audiences without having to uh, work for X amount of years at a luxury fashion house to now build up their credentials. They just can go directly to their fan base, which significantly accelerates the process of being able to bring a product to market. For brands, it's also being able to have ubiquitous presence, uh, especially outside of the major fashion capitals around the world, where, of course, you can come across flagship stores here and there, and you can experience the beauty of or the the unique experience that the brick and mortar store offers. But up until this day, e-commerce is, has still been primarily a process, not an experience, and really pales in comparison to what a brick and mortar experience really gives to the customer. So how can the metaverse step in or provide a, a, a playground for your brand to be able to showcase the other unique elements of your brand? So I think this is a very interesting opportunity and probably has a lot of longevity in it as um, this entire ecosystem matures too. Amazing. Up only then for <laughs> working, yeah, working sure. with brands, exploring the space. Yeah, I, I think that I completely agree with the sentiment around the Hollywood version of a metaverse mm-hmm. and where we are now. Um, I played around with uh, Decentraland within the Decentraland Fashion Week, and it was very cool. But it felt like the, we're at the beginning. Like it didn't feel like we're we're experiencing the polished version. You know, there were there were lots of awesome things happening, lots of crazy experiments. But there were still some like you know bugs, and there were still some some things that need to be ironed out. Um, but yeah, it felt like you know, wow, when this as this improves, it's going to be phenomenal. Right now it's cool and right now it's interesting and you can see what's happening and you can see how this can basically grow and be much bigger. So Mm -hmm. that's really exciting. Okay, so the last question I have for you um, is a question I ask everyone and it is if you could be the CMO, um, head of growth at any company uh, in this space, which one would it be and why? So 
one of my personal role models has always been Angela Ahrens because okay. I have loved seeing her journey as, um, uh, as she went from Liz Claiborne to then Burberry and how she transformed every single one of the organizations and how much she valued technology and incorporating technology into the e-commerce or the commerce retail experience. If I could uh, blend a company, uh, like uh, make a baby between Apple and Burberry, I think that would have been my ideal company, uh, a place that appreciates craftsmanship and the value of fashion in our lives, as well as the uh, experience of incorporating technology that's very design oriented and is quite a beautiful aesthetic experience as well. I think tech doesn't need to be necessarily um, you know, alienating or only being attractive to people that are interested in coding or something that's a bit more of a specific discipline. I think fashion has provides an amazing playground and an opportunity for uh, fashion tech to flourish together. So I would love I would love to imagine a company emerging in the future that's a blend between Burberry and Apple and um, heading growth for them. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, that, that I think, yeah, a company would immediately get all the VC money and get all the interest mm-hmm. in the world because it sounds, the concept of it sounds phenomenal. Um, yeah. <laughs> I would love to be, I would love to work there. <laughs> Can you give me yeah. a job? <laughs> of course. Amazing. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. It was, yeah, incredible to learn about uh, more about the, how the digital fashion industry is going to grow with uh, the Web3 world. Um, if people want to get in contact with you or follow you, uh, what you're up to, what's the best way they can do that? Yeah, I mean, as true to the native Web3 ecosystem, I think Twitter right now is one of the best places for us to connect. So uh, you can find me at AnaraXR on Twitter. I love to also curate a list of brands, companies, and creators who also are very interested in this topic. So feel free to message me or follow me, and I'd love to also meet you if we share these interests together. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, This podcast was brought to you by Hype Partners. Uh, We are a Web3 agency uh, helping brands, crypto companies, blockchain projects, organizations, communities grow. Um, You can check us out at hype.partners. Thank you so much, Nara. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.